All right. Well, I guess I'm back up here. Um, I will be talking about Euring again today. Actually, only the second talk I've given on the topic, as mentioned, 2019 here was the first one. Um, and I'll start with doing like a quick primer on what is Euring, and the rest is going to be mostly just, you know, what have we been working on since 2019, um, with a focus on, I think, some of the more recent things. I greatly prefer if uh, we make this a little more interactive than, um, than not. So if there's any questions throughout, please interrupt and we can take them as we go. I think that works, at least for me, a lot better than just me droning on for 40 minutes and then we do a couple of questions at the end. So uh, if I'm zoned out a little bit, you know, just wave your hands for something. We'll, we'll do the questions as we go. So the quick primer on IURing is it's, it's, it's just a way for the a kernel to talk to, uh, for an application talk with uh, the kernel in an efficient manner. And at the very core of it, uh, it's really uh, comprised of two different rings. So one is the submission ring. That's how the application tells the kernel that there's work to do. And then there's the completion ring, and that's how the kernel tells the application that you know there's now completions for some of these events. So one goes into the kernel and the other one goes out, and uh, that's pretty much the, the core of it. There's three system calls uh, associated with IU ring. One, IU ring setup. That one sets up um, two rings of a specific size that, that you pass in. And uh, if you use something like libu ring, right, it'll memory map these rings for you and have everything set up. Is this working OK? I'll move it away a little bit. Um, so that's only used for setup. Then you have IU ring enter. That's used for either waiting for events or submitting new events, basically any communication you do past, past setup. And then you have an IU ring register, which is sort of auxiliary functions, uh, registering buffers, files, things like that. We'll get into that a little bit more later. So I guess the first question is why? Why do we need something new? We already have uh, AIO, libAIO. I think there's a couple reasons for that. Um, the API of AIO is pretty inefficient and uh, horrible, I think, both from an aesthetic and usability point of view, but also in terms of efficiency. Right. So every time you submit anything uh, through AIO, you're copying in these arrays and you're copying data back out. Um, it's existed for a long time, but it's really only still got one use case, which is ODirect on storage. So it's really mostly just a database kind of thing. My vision with IURing was to do something we use for a bunch of other things, not just for that particular one niche uh, use case. And then the question was, well, we can maybe work on AO and make it better, but with some of the deficiencies it has, why don't we just try and come up with something new that'll do things better? So some of the key features of IURing, well, for one, it's actually, you know, async, which I think is, you know, for an async API is, is kind of important. LibAIO is only async for some cases. Uh, it's not async for a lot of cases and that the application doesn't even know about, right? So it'll, it'll work for things like buffered IO, but it wouldn't be async. Uh, it's async for odirect reads and writes on storage until it's not. Um, you don't really know. Um, so I wanted to make something that was efficient. So zero copy, not just for the actual data, but also the metadata describing operations. These two rings are shared memory. So whenever you fill in something uh, for the kernel to do, the kernel reads from that memory too, right? There's no uh, copy happen happening there. Lockless communication, rings are lockless. Um, something that was extendable, easy to use, and feature rich. So I wanted to do something that we could keep building on in the future. And I think looking back at these initial goals and, and what we support now, I think we, uh, we accomplished that pretty good. Uh, and then there's liburing. Um, you can use the raw kernel interface. I think most applications end up using liburing. It's a much easier interface to, uh, to approach. Uh, it's, it's a very light interface. It's supposed to be fast to use, um, kernel independent. So you can use the newest liburing right, with an old kernel, doesn't matter. Some features won't be available, but that's because they rely on kernel features. But there's no, we're not tying liburing to uh, the kernel version at all. It helps hide some of the quirkiness that inevitably happens with APIs. You know, you introduce new features or you find things that are maybe a little unfortunate. In the kernel, we can't really fix them up. But at least with the liburing, we can provide an API that then kind of gets around a couple of those rough edges. So a quick example of how you'd use IU ring. So this is the very basic of examples. So you'll set up a ring, that's the IU ring queue in it. Here we put in an eight, that's just in a queue depth of eight and uh, no special flags. And then there's a function IU ring get SQE, returns a submission queue entry for you. You call a prep function on it. In this example, it's a read. 
fill it in with whatever's required for that prep function. You know, it's a read, so you want a buffer, you want a file descriptor, and the size of it, and then the offset. Then you submit it, and then you can go do something else, and then at some point you want to call IU ring wait CQE, which waits for a completion. Uh, if there's already one available in the ring, say you're doing other work and you come back and this read is completed, this won't even enter the kernel. It'll just uh, pop this entry off of the ring. And then you can look at the result of it, and then finally you have to mark it as seen. So that updates, increments the CQE ring head, telling the kernel that we've now seen the CQE. So a quick note on lifetimes, when you set up a ring, you'll note the eight that I had back here, that's the number of submission queue entries that we're asking for. The lifetime of those is really only from submit. So once we get past the point here where we've done our ring submit, this submission queue entry has been, um, has been consumed by the kernel. So it only really limits the, uh, the, the batch count that you can submit um, at once. It, it's not really tied to how many things you can have in flight. On Functions that pass in structures describing requests, things like, um, you know, if you pass in a message header for networking operations, those have to be valid only across submission. So you don't need to keep them valid all the way until uh, completion. And then the example doesn't do this, but normally when you prepare a request, right, you store some sort of data, like a tag or a cookie associated with it. So when you get the completion, that'll have the same tag or, or, or um, cookie associated with it and, then, and allow you to tie a completion back to the submission. The wait functions, again, tell you nothing about the result of the request. I recently had someone um, be confused about this, so I figured I'd bring it up. The, uh, the request itself right, contains the completion event. The wait uh, has nothing to do with it. You get an unrelated request completing uh, throughout that wait. So what's new? Well, um, I want to jump to this one first. So this is something I stole that, that someone wrote up and I thought was pretty good. But it, it shows you sort of the rough flow through IU ring uh, from submission. So you form a request up on the right, and you go in and you attempt to issue it. And then one of, of two things can happen, right? Either the request succeeds, you're reading from a socket and there's data there. You go all the way to the right, post completion, right, you're done. Um, if nothing is there, now we have to wait for it. So you have two options at that point. You can either go down and arm some sort of internal poll, uh, which would work the same way as if you did ePoll on the socket. And that internal poll will say, you know, let me know when there's data available, and then you'll read it. Or you can go to what we call the worker pool or the IO workers. That's considered the slow path in IU ring, and most things don't use it, but it, it is an option. And one of the, the things that we did for 512 was to make these native workers be actually native. So it, back when IU ring was initially done, we had specific kernel threads that took on the uh, responsibility of, of issuing these requests which was difficult to manage because now you have to sort of assume the personality of the original application and how many components are involved with that. It's really hard to keep track of. You have things like credentials, memory management, file struct, and, and a whole bunch of other things. And the way that the kernel is done, um, you really don't know which of these components you end up using for any specific request. So one of the changes that we made uh, was to switch to native workers, which were basically then just uh, threads off of the original application. That makes it so that we now don't have to have any sort of tracking code for uh, dealing specifically with uh, assuming the personality of a, of a different task. Since these are just native threads at this point, um, things just kind of work out uh, naturally. So the only thing that makes it different from normal user space threads is they'd never exit to user space. So once they would normally exit to user space, right, they're just uh, reaped. Um, so they never leave the kernel and they're only spawned inside the kernel. It helped with a bunch of security issues uh, that we had in this particular area. It also helped uh, some corner cases um, when, say, an application uh, had a request punted to this IO worker thread and it ended up opening, say, and reading proc self. You can imagine you get some interesting results at that point. It also made something we, uh, we call SQ poll, which is a way to offload um, any kind of submission to the kernel. So you can do system call less IO made that uh, possible to work with pretty much uh, any request that, that um, IU ring supports. Another tweak that was made there is, uh, if we go back to the slide here again, usually when you offload to this worker pool, um, that would then do a blocking attempt at the request, which means that it would sit there and be blocked until you know data or space was available um, uh, for a socket operation. Now that supports pull, so it'll internally do a pull operation and not sit and waste resources. 
So that was another change that we uh, re most recently made and call that hybrid mode. Again, something that, not something that's visible directly to the application outside of, of doing tracing, um, but it just makes things more uh, efficient in general. Um, other work that went on is, is not necessarily tied to IUring, but one of, of the ways that IUring completes uh, requests when it's done is to use something called task work. Task work is a way to queue, uh, sort of works kind of like work queues in the kernel if you're familiar with those, but the difference is that you queue them with the original task. Um, so it runs in the context of that task and it's handled very much like signals. So that means if you get task work, at least if it's, it's signal task work and you're running in user space, you get interrupted, get into the kernel and you run this task work and then you go back out again. The problem with the signal based um, task work is that it very much works like signals. And if, if you're in a threaded application, uh, signals can be very unhandy to deal with uh, since you have a shared uh, signal struct and they um, also result in quite a lot of locking contention. So one thing that was done was to introduce a, a notion of sort of fake signals in the kernel called tip notify signals that decouples the act of interrupting someone uh, in the system call from uh, signals itself. This yielded some really nice performance benefits. It was really miserable work since you need to touch. If you've ever done kernel work that touches all the architectures, you'll, you'll sympathize with this. Um, but you end up having to dive into S390 uh, assembly code or architectures that don't even have a cross compiler. It ends up being pretty miserable. But it was worthwhile doing, and I'm, I'm glad we got it done. But I'm not doing it again. Um, a feature they have is something called direct descriptors. Um, everybody's familiar with normal file descriptors. IUring supports something called direct descriptors, which are like file descriptors, but they uh, exist outside of the normal file table and they're only valid within that specific ring itself. If you've ever, ever done any profiling on uh, systems that run production workloads, you've undoubtedly seen something like fget or fput or fget light or fput light in your profiles. It can usually be uh, quite dominant. Once you have threaded applications and they're sharing a file struct, um, now you have to do reference counting on files and uh, that is more costly than, than most people realize unless you've done this profiling. So by moving the file descriptors into IUring itself, uh, we can um, keep a permanent reference to them and avoid these fget fput uh, per system call. Yes. One thing I've seen people complain about in the past is how file descriptors have to be granted in numerical order. Do direct descriptors avoid that too? Yeah, um, direct descriptors, I'll get into this in a little bit here too, but for the original direct descriptors, the application manages them, right? So you say, I want descriptor six for this file, and then that's what you get. Um, but yeah, we don't have to adhere to any sort of POSIX craziness that you need to get the lowest available file descriptor and stuff like that. Cool. So, and exactly because we do, the application does pick the file descriptor itself, you can also now use files for do link sequences, something that IUring supports, where you can say, submit these three requests, right, and they're depending on each other. Um, so you can do like an open file X, read from file X, close file X, and then don't tell me about it until you're done with the whole thing, right? So it means you can do one single submission uh, for all these different things. But it does mean that you need to know when you open file X, you know, what FDs am, am I going to get? But if you have direct descriptors, that becomes it becomes pretty easy. So here's an example, right? That's what it usually looks like. And then when you do direct descriptors, then we move all these file descriptors that's in the shared struct. Each um, ring just has its own. So that's using it is, is pretty trivial and, and straightforward. You just have to register an, an array of these. And um, then when you fill in your submission queue entry, just tell it this is a fixed file and this is the the fixed file index it works just like a file descriptor. and the only difference is it's only valid within this specific ring. Um, a new, you can also instantiate it directly, right? Normal approach would be, I'm gonna open a file and then we're gonna register the file descriptor. Um, but the operations that instantiate file descriptors within IUring can also do it directly. Right? So you can do an accept of something and get a direct descriptor rather than a file descriptor, which means that now you've never even had a file descriptor, you just keep everything within the ring. So one of the most recent changes we made was uh, to have managed file descriptors. So that now means that instead of having the application manage the space, now you can have IUring manage it just like you would regular file descriptors, but still have all the benefit of direct descriptors. Um, this is new in 5.19, uh, which is not released yet, you know, but it, it'll come. 
but basically anything that supports instantiating direct descriptors can now do so, and they'll just get one free one out of the pool. And as Omar uh, asked about, there's just no, we don't give any guarantees other than we'll give you a free file descriptor if one is available, but we don't have any um, crazy rules like it has to be the lowest available one or it's going to be in round robin or anything like that. So the last bit is, if you go back to this slide right here, you can see the ring itself obviously is still in the file descriptor. When you instantiate a ring, you get a file descriptor, and that's how we manage kind of these lifetimes. So that means when you do the IU ring enter system called to submit things, you're still doing an fget and an fput on the ring itself. Uh, so a recent addition was to be able to, in a um, non-dependency uh, problematic fashion, register the ring descriptor itself. Um, so you can avoid it for the ring itself too. So that kind of eliminates the last little bit there, uh, depending on how efficient you can batch uh, IO ring enter uh, versus uh, submitting IO, then that can be uh, important. Provided buffers is something we made a lot of changes to recently. And uh, to quickly explain what that is, is when you, when you transition from something that's a readiness-based uh, model where you use, uh, for instance, ePoll to manage receives on a socket. At that point, you have a very opportune moment to uh, get an IO buffer, right? That's when ePoll tells you there's data to receive. With IO ring, that can be more difficult because it's kind of fire and forget. You just submit your uh, receive and then at some point it will complete. But it also means if you have you know thousands of pending receives, you don't want to have a thousand pending buffers in flight at the same time. So provided buffers is a way to do that with IO ring where you manage a buffer pool on the side and then when the receive uh, finally says I'm sorry, I'm ready to receive I.O., uh, I.O. ring will pick a buffer from that pool and then do the receive and then tell you about it. So how do you use provided buffers? You basically just register them with I.O. ring um, and then you use a, um, a, a prep provide buffers command to sort of send them in. That one can, you can give it like, you know, mega at a time and chop it up. Um, each buffer group has a, a buffer group ID associated with it. So if you have different kinds of buffers that you use for I.O., say maybe you have, you know, your initial receive is like a connection request kind of thing and you do handshaking stuff, you have a smaller buffer. Um, or maybe, you know, you're doing streamed I.O. Uh, receiving for something, you use bigger buffers. Uh, for using it, you be easy again for SQE flags. You just set the buffer select flag, and then you indicate a buffer group to pick one from. And then once it's ready to receive, right, you'll you'll get it. Uh, provided buffers only work for read or receive like operations. Obviously, it doesn't make sense to do writes or sends and picking random buffers into kernel. And then once it completes, you'll have a flag set in the CQE, and the CQE flags will also contain the buffer ID that was picked within that group. One of the issues with the, uh, the classic provided buffers that I just described is that it slows things down uh, quite a lot. Um, I'll have some numbers on that in a second. So one new addition for 519 is what we call ring provided buffers. So instead of, of asking IU ring to provide these buffers, we just share a ring, again, another ring, between the application and the kernel. And the application will just put buffers, um, provide buffers by incrementing uh, that ring, and the kernel will uh, consume from it. So the uh, you, the, um, the liburing functions associated with that are down at the bottom. Um, pretty self-explanatory, I think. You can register a buffer ring, and then you can add to it, add buffers to it. And then once buffers have been uh, added, right, you can advance it, which then provides it to the kernel. The last function mentioned is one that combines the, when you're reaping entries on the completion queue ring, um, with provide, ring provided buffers, you can efficiently just provide back single buffers at the time. So it's a way for you to bundle the operation of uh, atomically writing um, both indices at the same time, the completion queue, and a provided buffer ring. A lot of these details right, are nicely hidden um, behind the Liburing API. So as long as you use the provided functions and read the man pages, then you'll, you'll be okay. Ran some quick benchmarks just for, uh, comparing the classic buffers with the new provided buffers. Um, and as you can see, if you use provided buffers, the classic ones, uh, in a very synthetic test case, which just does NOP operations, which means that the act of, you know, getting the buffers themselves are uh, a substantial part of, of the work you're doing, then you're dropping anywhere from like 50% to 63, 66% of the performance. And with the ring provided buffers, you end up being pretty close. I think the most important thing from this slide is that you're, you're very close to the theoretical performance of, of doing the NOPs. Um, and the other big one is that 
you can replenish buffers back to the kernel. Say when you've done your receive, you get your data, you process it, right? And then you want to give it back to the ring. The easiest uh, way for the application to do that is just do them one at a time. Um, and you can do that now and not have any sort of performance drop. Before with classic buffers application, you would need to sort of batch and bundle updates a little bit um, to get the, the performance that they desired. Another networking oriented thing that was added recently or in 5.19 is something called receive send poll first and an associated completion flag called sock empty. So which when you go and, and to go back into the whole thing again, when you go and issue receive, what we'll do internally is, um, as mentioned in that earlier flowchart, you'll go and try and do the receive. And if there's no data there, right, you'll do a poll and that'll trigger your eventual retry of that receive. Um, IURing will now pass back if there is more data in the socket when you're done with a receive. So, and the application can then use that to inform IURing of whether it's, uh, if it's expecting data in the socket or not when we do the initial receive. Obviously doing the initial attempt at receiving data if there's nothing there is just a waste of cycles and time. Uh, so by providing back this hint on uh, whether there was data left in the socket when we're done, that'll make, uh, and then enable the application to tell you what to do if you want to do initial receive or just arm pull first for that stuff. Um, another big addition from 519 is something called Uring Command. Uring Command is, is a way to uh, plumb up private kind of uh, ioctal like requests through the stack. And um, the initial consumer of this in, in 519 is NVMe pass through support. So if you had to do any sort of admin queue or um, raw IO commands to NVMe in the past, the only option you had was to use ioctals, which are like any other system call, you know, synchronous. Now through this, now you can do any sort of IO command to NVMe in an async, uh, async fashion. Um, and the way that we do this is through this uh, Uring command, but I, there's a lot of, of potential to use this for other things in the kernel. Um, one of the issues that we have, for instance, with director scripters is if you instantiate them directly, now you can no longer do, you know, set sock opt or get socked opt, these kinds of calls on them. Um, so this would be a way that we can pl plumb some of this up, I think, pretty nicely. Um, we can also extend the flag, you know, for the receive saying, oh, if uh, we can not only tell you there's more uh, data left in the socket, right, we could actually tell you in the completion saying, you know, Use the thousand bytes you asked for, and by the way, there's still three thousand bytes in the socket to receive. One of the ways we can do that is that parts that were extended with the pass-through support was adding support for what we call SQE 128 and CQE 32. So the submission you entries are usually, uh, or they're always 64 bytes in size. Uh, with this now, they become 128. So that just means you can support bigger commands, and the CQE, the completion queue entries, um, can now be expanded to be 32 bytes instead of the currently 16 which then also means you can pass back more information at completion time, obviously sacrificing some memory and a bit of, of um, efficiency in, in, uh, in the process. But it was required to be able to do async um, NVMe pass-through since we pass back more than, um, more than just a single integer that uh, system calls usually do. It means that you avoid any sort of indirection too. So if with 128 byte of submission queue entry, you can pass the whole thing in line. Don't have to do any indirect copies of NVMe commands or anything like that. And similarly on completion, right? You can pass back um, an extra 264 bit values if you need to. Didn't need that much, but we had to keep it a power of two for this. And um, another change that we made also in 519. 519 was a busy release if you can't tell. Uh, but one is, is uh, I guess, a little difficult to understand, but again, goes back to the task work that I mentioned um, earlier. When you do have something that needs to complete on a year inside and use task work, then by default, we'll send you a signal to interrupt the application to get it done. That's not strictly needed for a lot of cases, right? You need to interrupt weights in the kernel, um, but you don't necessarily need to interrupt an application that's just chugging along and uses space doing something unless it's uh, uh, actively looking for a completion event. Uh, so we added a couple of flags uh, for the ring setup for this, um, which will work for most applications. Um, the exception being some applications that do the separate uh, submission and completions into two different tasks, right? That's one way that you can legitimately share a ring between uh, different users. Um, but if you don't do that, then you can set these flags. 
and it means it won't interrupt you in, in user space unless you actively uh, start looking for completions. For most things, this won't really matter. Some network workloads that we looked at, this makes quite a substantial difference just because it allows the application to utilize its, its full um, slice of, of scheduling and not being interrupted all the time. So if you have a high frequency of completions coming in, then it'll, it'll make a difference. In general, it's one of those things that I wish we'd done earlier so we could have made this the default behavior instead of having these kind of, you know, go faster stripes kind of flags, which are really annoying to deal with, um, which is why I wanted to put it in, in this talk and also put it in the, uh, in the main pages. So hopefully people can adopt it if it's useful for them. We support a wide range of cancellations uh, that are extended in 519 as well. Um, the user data you ass assign with the submission queue entry is also how you key off cancellations and IURing. That becomes a little unhandy, say if you've got multiple requests pending for a, a specific file or a socket, and, that now, and that's now getting closed, you just want to cancel whatever's uh, associated with that file or socket. Uh, could be people, there's some uh, applications that like reusing rings. Um, instead of if they often do set up and tear down of them. Um, the existing cancellation we have before this was only use the data based, right? So you'd look up based on that, cancel one. And if you had multiple to cancel, I right, you'd need to ask for all of them. Now we support a mix of all any and FD. So you can cancel, say, everything that matches this FD um, or everything that, ma you know, on this specific ring. Uh, another interesting thing that was added for 519 is called multi-shot uh, accept. So usually for IU, you issue a request and you get a completion, right? And you're done. That's the life cycle of things. Um, a while back, we added support for multi-shot pull, which is a way to arm a pull for a file or a socket and say, just let me know whenever something happens, right? So you submit it once, and then whenever this condition becomes true that you asked for, you'll get a completion event trigger for it. And uh, for 5.19, we, uh, support was added for uh, accept to do the same thing. So instead of, of submitting an accept request and then you get, uh, um, it completes, and then you need to submit another one, now you can just submit a single accept for uh, that particular destination. And then whenever a connection request comes in, right, you get a completion. So it's something that makes it easier to use um, and also obviously more efficient since you don't need to continually keep submitting um, accept requests for that particular destination. And something a little more, uh, a little different, uh, message ring support was added. It's a way to send uh, messages between rings. So the original use case for this was someone who say has a, uh, sits there and accepts connections and then at the point when the connection comes in, right, wants to hand it off to someone else to do the actual work. And uh, by deferring that decision to the latest possible, it gives you better, better balancing. So message ring is just a very basic way of sending one mess or one, uh, a 32 bit and a 64 bit entry between two different rings in the system. Uh, it didn't seem like it was super interesting to me, but I did think that it might have potential implications for uh, being able to do a file descriptor passing between the rings. So not in the classical SCM kind of sense, uh, but if you use open or sorry, direct or fixed descriptors with IURing, then it'd be a way for you to pass in between the rings in um, similar how you'd use SCM on regular file descriptors. That support is not there yet, but it's something that uh, at least I've been pondering. I think we'll skip this one. Um, just a bunch of random optimizations. I mean, there's a lot of things that have happened. When I initially talked about IURing here in, in, in uh, 2019, that was right after it was done, and we've had a lot of changes since then. Uh, so I won't go through all of these, um, but so just a random list of some of the other things that, that we've worked on in terms of making things more efficient. Some end up being core changes like the lookup cache, which is a way to do non-blocking file lookups. Um, you can also do that outside of IURing since it is just a lookup flag. Um, but yeah, this is just a rough list of that. So a new release of LibUring is coming pretty soon. I actually plan to do this after 5.18 was released, but then I figured we might as well, since there's a lot of stuff happening, 5.19 might as well wait. Um, I think the big one that people would be interested in is that uh, 2.1 of LibUring had eight man pages, and three of those, I think, or four was describing currently things. 2.2 uh, .2 has 80. Uh, so pretty much all of LibUring is documented now in the man pages. Um, we added more than 5,000 lines of man pages, which I think is pretty great. We added even more lines of regression tests. So whenever we find a bug in the kernel, uh, 
or whenever we add a new feature or we add a slew of regression tests for it. Cross-platform. Um, some of you may not be aware, but Microsoft actually added something called IO Rings in Windows 11, which is uh, pretty much a straight copy of IO Ring, um, which I thought was interesting. Um, they have added to it again recently, I think broadening the scope a little bit. It's very limited, um, but it, it will enable you know cross-platform cross applications utilizing IO Ring to run on Windows as well. I think their initial motivation for this was direct storage was being too slow, I think, for their Xbox. Um, yeah, if you have any interest in this, uh, Yarden Shafir has done, uh, she did a talk at P99 about this, and she's done various blog posts, most recently one about, um, I think, a security breach that was in IU Ring. So it's, it's interesting to see they don't just copy features, also all the security flaws we had. Um, I saw some rumors about FreeBSD version in the works. I don't know if this is true or not, but apparently somebody was working on it. Um, and then there's the uh, there's uh, uh, someone did a libwinring a library which aims to make cross-platform uh, Windows and Linux IURing applications uh, feasible. Upcoming features. I'm going to go through this real quick, but I think uh, one of the big ones is true async buffer write support. That's the main missing thing that we have. Stefan is uh, one of my co-workers that's been working on this. Uh, I think it's version six has been uh, six has been posted recently uh, and uh, looks like it's going through review. So hopefully we'll have that in 520. Uh, ButterFS will be coming after that. General networking things. Uh, we've done a lot of those recently. I think we'll continue to do them. We have an internal uh, project trying to convert uh, Thrift to use IA Ring, uh, which I think, uh, and that's where some of these features have, have been coming from. How does the uh, async buffered writes work? Do you need file system specific support for that? You do. Yeah, it's it's a it's a well. How does it work? It, it's complicated. The big the big thing on buffered writes is the bound thirty pages that is always done, um, and it seems like it'd be easy to support async buffered writes because when you do a write system call write, most of them will not block. The problem is how do you handle the cases that will that, that do. So it's all about uh, file inode update time, for instance. Right? That's one, bounce 30 pages. Um, so yeah, you do need specific support, which is why it's just targeted XFS initially. Um, I mean, if, if they all used IOMAP, you'd mostly be done, right? But then you have ButterFS that uses it for some things, but not really writes, and so. We're working on it. Yeah. So it's, it's not too difficult to support. I think it's mostly in the core, because you need to have a an, an async bounce 30 pages, essentially. One that tells you I'm going to block instead of just blocking. Um, uh, uh, improving on the uh, provided buffers, one idea that's been tossed around was let's do incrementally uh, consume provided buffers. Uh, right now, when you pick a provided buffers, right, you pick the whole thing. So if you supply 4K buffers, then um, no matter if you only receive 32 bytes, right, you'll use the whole thing and then you have to provide it back. If you could uh, just consume off of the top, um, of the provided buffers for OC, that would make it interesting. Uh, level triggered poll support. Um, yes, yeah, the note says, actually when doing these slides, I ended up just doing support for that. So that'll be in 520. Um, the poll support we have in our hearing now is only edge triggered. Um, and this will just bring us so we always also support level triggered. And, oh yeah, and the big one, one of the main complaints uh, from Linus for the poll request this time was that Oh my God, I can't believe this file is 13,000 lines of code. And I was, I was waiting for the day when he would bring that up because it does keep growing. So I spent some time splitting it up. So now the main file is about 4,000 lines of code and everything's been split into like topical or uh, opcode handler kind of stuff. So that'll be a huge pain in the butt for backports for quite a while. But I think at some point you gotta rip off the bandaid and get that done. Uh, faster IO work queue offload. I uh, won't get into the uh, details on that, I think. Um, but one idea that I've, I've had for a long time is that, as, as Omar just asked on the rights, and you know, lots of system calls will generally not block. But the problem is when they, you don't know when they will. So if we could opportunistically uh, submit any kind of request and just handle a blocking point in some sort of sane fashion, that would make it really easy to support pretty much any system call. Uh, through our earring and um, without losing any performance over um, punting anything async. Uh, so that's something I've been pondering for a long time without having any specific plans how to tackle it, but it kind of goes back to some of you, some of you remember the uh, 
initial threadlet and fibrils and a call stuff from Ingo back in the mid 2000s. So we're we're back, but he tried to do something similar like this. Uh, but now we have the full infrastructure for the API and everything already going. Right, so doing something like this might be interesting. And the uh, the, the last one, iter ubuff, is um, also actually a general kernel thing. Lots of people use vectored I/O interfaces and don't need any vectors. Right, they only pass in one vec anyway. Uh, so iter ubuff is just a way for more efficient to deal with single vectored I/O. Uh, some don't even have a choice. If you're doing read, uh, receive message, or send message, right, you have to provide a vector. Um, and uh, some recent conversions of uh, some uh, drivers shows that the vectored interface in the kernel is substantially slower than the non-vectored. Nobody wants a 5% performance hit. Um, so iter u above is a way to kind of get around that. Um, so we'll see what happens there. Alviro has been sort of taken over that project. And uh, I don't want to poke the bear too much. So we'll see what comes out. Uh, final words. Um, so the big thing about our is right, it's, it's, it's a unified completion model. It doesn't matter what kind of file type you have. Unix is really big on everything is the file. Yeah, that's all well and good, but you treat the files differently depending on what files they are, right? So some you can pull for, some you can't. Um, if you do completion based, you can treat them all the same. That also means the retrofitting, especially in networking bits, can be difficult to existing applications and lots of, of conversions will just say switch to using iuring uh, for events and at that point you're still kind of readiness based right you're just using a different backend and they're not at least to me super interesting i think to reap the full benefit of it right you need to uh to do some more uh, heavier lifting to retrofit it but you know we're in it for the long run i i joked about when i started this thing it's a 10-year project and i very much still believe that it is now we're three or four years down the line um, both to build a ball support for everything that, that people need and have the efficiency that you need, it, it takes a long time. And converting applications uh, and libraries right takes even longer. Some people are only just now learning about IU Ring, um, so I'm, I'm sure it'll it'll be a while. We yes. chatted about this uh, just two days ago and uh, seconds ago. We have a work item on system D to switch or at least to uh, provide. Uh, IOU ring as an alternative backend to the EPOL based event loop. So the, it's it's not that trivial. This, the semantics sometimes are quite uh, quite different. But it's the level triggered, for instance, and the edge triggered why was a is a big one. I think for that particular use. Yeah, case. but I think it, uh, there will be a lot of good wins. I just saw the multi shot accept, which yeah, sounds really nice. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to downplay the fact that there are some conversions that are just e pulled i uring because I do think they make sense. Um, but we've had some internally when, when people just update the event-based library, right, and you're still using the same kind of model, it makes it difficult to use, say, the provided buffers and other things like that. So it really depends on use case, right? Some are totally fine to be done and, and should just be done in a straightforward fashion. All right, that is all I had. Questions? Yes. Do you have uh, examples of applications that uh, make use of uh, U-rings and take real benefits uh, from them? Yes, uh, this is something I generally do every time we do like performance review stuff. Uh, there's a long list of them at this point. Um, Samba is one of them. Um, QEMU uses it, right, if you set the back end. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of blanking right now. If I, I'll, I can provide you with a, with a list. Um, I only look them up every now and then just to see if there's anything new, but I generally don't keep the list uh, in my head. But there's there's a good chunk out there now, I think. So you're seems like. talking about QMU. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about networking, video, everything that needs a zero copy. Uh, does uh, our like, uh, non-applications, uh, non-programs over than QMU? Yeah, there is. Uh, there was actually one, I, and that's even referenced on here. The bottom note that I have here in the Dragonfly that was just announced the other day, which is a Redis uh, memcached D replacement that uses IURing for uh, all I/O, so networking and disk, uh, disk alike. Um, but you're probably better off just, I think, googling or searching on GitHub or something like that. Um, yeah, I, have, I haven't really kept track of it. More likely a, a comment. Uh, 
for people who didn't have the chance to follow what occurred with uh, IRing, uh, can you tell the assembly how much IOPS you are not able to take from a single core? Uh, I think many are not have, doesn't have these numbers in mind. It's uh, it's so incredible that I think it could be also shared to to get people understand how much IRA is providing performance per core. Yeah, I can talk about that briefly. One one of my initial uh, goals was to. Uh, to convert some of the people that, that think they need SPDK to do really fast storage. So last year we started a project, it was like, you know, let's see how many IOPS can we get out of a single core using um, IOU ring. And we did the initial numbers and I think it was around 6 million or something like that on a core, which seems pretty decent, but it wasn't, at least to me, uh, good enough. And then after uh, a lot of, of work uh, through the stack, mostly block layer stuff actually, uh, we ended up at around 13 to 14 million uh, per core on uh, a modern system. So I think there's still going to be cases where SPDK is, is faster than IURing, um, but it comes with a lot of downsides too, right? So I just wanted to make that trade off at least a little harder to make for some of these use cases. Uh, so if we long term are thinking about moving uh, like system calls into IOU ring and having things kind of be async by default, do you think that we're going to need to think about how to improve the runtime in general to be more async and to give callers primitives like promises, futures, and everything like that? Yeah, oh, honestly, the the big problem with doing adding support for a system call for IOU ring is it's all classic Linux and Unix where a system call is you know by definition synchronous. And sometimes, right, you can split things up a little bit. I think the lookup cache for opens is a good example of that, right? So you can do the fast path. You can do that without blocking. So it makes it easier to support. Um, some other system calls, right, are just, I think, sync by nature and really hard to split up into different operations. Or they require so much surgery to the core of the kernel that it becomes impossible. That's why I kind of like the approach of, you know, if we could just attempt and catch if it if it's not, async, then we could support it a, a much easier, I think. So I think with all the, I mean, Linux supports a crap ton of system calls and to go through and update all that would be really difficult. So I'm I'm probably more of the little bit hacky band-aid kind of solution, but if you could attempt to issue and then pass off the state if it doesn't work and still be async that way, then you can do the, the, the sync path uh, inline and fast, right, which is also important. I mean, one of the benefits of synchronous system calls is that if they don't block, right, they're really fast. Um, but I, I do think that's probably a approach to do unless you want to re-architect a lot of things. Yes? What's your stance on, maybe you've already answered this and I just missed it, but uh, what's your stance on moving yeah, synchronous system calls into IO Euring, like in, in two ways. First of all, existing system calls, like if I were to come up and say I want to have system call X available as a new command in IO Euring. And the second question is what if I wanted to implement a specific functionality that is not exposed as a regular system call? So basically, yeah. precedent in IO Euring, not on a system level, system call base. I think I think both are fine. Um, I you know we added a lot of we have I ring upcodes now that mimic system calls or are system calls like an I accept call right. It's very much just an accept. But you also support upcodes that right where no uh, similar system call exists right now. So yeah, both would be totally fine. I think it all depends on the use case. As long as the internals are done in such a way right that you can sanely not block for an initial at, uh, issue, for example, right, then it's easy to support. Neat. Down here. Hi. Um, so, if I understand correctly, so you kind of be placing or providing an alternative to file descriptors with tied descriptors. And what about tied uh, credentials? Yes. And all the, you know, the access control checks, LSM hooks, and so on. You can, you can register uh, credentials with the ring as well, and then you can set desired credentials when you submit a request. So you can, you can support that. Samba actually uses that for, uh, for their eye hearing stuff. And that's where the support initially came from. Was there more to the question? You had something on the direct descriptors. Yeah, it's, um, so, so um, you know, there's a lot of uh, history about file descriptors and security checks, and uh, especially some LSMs which use 
uh, what specific books. And uh, yeah, I was wondering if, uh, well, uh, it is the same use case as the file descriptor, and if the thread model is kind of the same. Um, you know, um, I guess some security modules check for every read and write operation, so that, of course, may not be what you want for higher readings. Um, but um, yeah, for some use cases, that might be useful anyway. Yeah, they very much work in the same way, right? And there's still a, a signed integer, so there's no difference there. And internally, it's a struct file. So it's just the only real difference is how you, uh, that the regular ones you need to reference and dereference all the time, right? And these you do not because you just, the ring has a permanent reference to it. And then I Euring deals with not introducing circular loops. Um, so, I, so you can't turn the ring FD into a classic registered file direct to script, right? You have sort of have to jump through hoops a little bit to do it. Anything else? All right, well, thank you.